All right, people, let's get into it. It is hard to ask for everything. Filmmaking equipment is getting better and better, and the cost of that equipment is coming more and more down, which for independent filmmakers, solo shooters, owner operators, uh, is the best news ever. And this is the most recent of that trend. This is Great Joy's 50 millimeter T2.9 anamorphic lens. As always, you will find the chapter markers uh, below in the description as well as in the playhead at the bottom of this video. So if there's anything that I have said that you want to repeat or if anything uh, that you wanna skip ahead to that's more relevant to you, that is how you would navigate that. Let's talk about the lens itself. The first thing is that it is an entirely metal build. So the construction of this lens is quite robust. It has a focus ring with a 270 degree focal throw, which gives you an incredible amount of control when pulling focus. The next ring down here is the aperture ring, which is a T29 to T22. The front element here is an 82 millimeter thread, meaning that I can take standard circular filters and put them on here with confidence. In terms of mounts for this lens, uh, you get this in a range of mounts. So you would be able to get this in all of your standard current gen mirrorless mounts. So that's your E mount, your RF mount, L mount, micro four thirds, anything that you could want, you have that as with a lot of your budget anamorphics. But where this uh, differs is that you also have EF and PL as well. And those would be the mounts that I would recommend anybody gets because those are the easiest mounts to adapt out to any sort of camera. So I have the EF here, it works well, it goes to all of the things that I use, so that works really nicely. Underneath, you'll see that it has a quarter 20 thread support here. Uh, this lens is not that heavy nor that long, but if you did feel the need to support that, if you feel like you've got a particularly weak camera mount, uh, that is a way that you can do that onto a rail system. This of course has your standard Mod 08 uh, teeth on it. So your gears across both of these rings uh, will work fine with any sort of follow focus or fizz system. This lens has a 11 aperture blades, so it creates fairly spherical or elliptical bokeh. It doesn't seem super angular like some of the other ones that have like six blades in them. So you do get a really nice kind of creamy bokeh out of this lens, uh, which again is pretty remarkable for the price. You can get this in either the blue or amber flaring. We'll get more into flaring in a little bit. This is a blue flare, but if you back the crowdfunding, you can of course get it in either one, which is cool. Uh, I always prefer amber flares to blue flares, but they only had blue flares when they sent this to me. So that's what this one is. Didn't have any negative issues with it or side effects with it. It worked just fine. Last thing real quick about this is the weight. This lens comes in at 2.3 to 2.4 pounds or 1.04 to 1.09 kilograms. Uh, it just depends on what mount you have this on. So depending whether it's PL, EF, whatever, uh, that's kind of the range that it lives in though. Great joy did send this to me for my review, but I am in no way obligated to say anything good about this. And I am just glad that this isn't a total piece of crap. But before we talk about this lens, the things that I like, the things that I don't like and quirks that you need to know before buying or shooting with this, first let's take a look at a short film that I filmed with this.
Okay, the first thing that I like is the fact that the mounting options, that you have PL or EF as an option. If you're gonna be spending $1,600, $1,700 on a lens, you're gonna to wanna to have it in a mount that's very easily adaptable to any system that you might not even be on right now. By just having mirrorless mounts like many of the other anamorphic lenses do, uh, it limits your ability to adapt things down or out. So that's huge. I have this in EF, but EF or PL, either of those uh, would be what I would invest or spend my time in. The next thing that I like about this lens actually isn't even really about this lens. Great Joy has already announced that they're coming out with a 35 and an 85 millimeter version uh, of this build and this lens set. So you would actually be able to have a complete and identical lens set, 35, 50, and 85. It's awesome that they're not abandoning the project, but they are going to continue out to build this line. So I think that that's really good and it helps me as a filmmaker feel confident in investing in a lens because I know that I'm gonna be able to continue that series out as opposed to just having kind of a whole bunch of one-off lenses. Another thing that I really like about this lens is the minimum focal distance. So you can get this up to 0.7 meters away or about 27 and a half inches away and still be able to maintain a really clean focus. Uh, a lot of anamorphics have a much further minimum focal distance and, and you can't really get up close and get some of the more intimate shots that you may want to get. Shooting with anamorphic isn't just about the aspect ratio. It, it isn't just about the flares. It is about creating an aesthetic. And the nice thing I like about this lens is that it feels like a classic anamorphic lens in that it is perfectly imperfect. We don't want something that's super clinical, that's super clean. We want something that has character, and this does have character. So while you can maintain good focus, it's not overly sharp. Uh, you do have rectilinear distortion, where you've got a little barrel distortion on your top and bottom lines, and you have a little pin cushion distortion coming in on the uh, left and right sides. But that is part of the look of an anamorphic lens. So this is good in that you can have sharp images without it feeling super crunchy. And I again shot this on the red, which is a, in 6K, and it held up fine from an image fidelity standpoint. I didn't feel like it was soft. I didn't feel like I wasn't able to attain focus. It, it did its job and it did its job quite well. But if you're looking for a perfect lens, in terms of, of how it renders an image, anamorphic's not your bag. I found very little to almost no chromatic aberration, a little bit of fringing on the edges, but again, nothing that's distracting from the image and it just kind of adds to the overall look and feel. Uh, but again, coming back to flaring, which is something that I do want to make sure I talk about, this has little to no flaring. Uh, unless you were to take a flashlight and shine the flashlight directly down the barrel of the lens, you're not going to be catching stray light and it's not going to be then shining these crazy lights all over your screen. And I like that a lot. I, when I think of anamorphic, the streaking is the last thing that I actually want. It's much more about the behavior and character of the lens than it is about anything else. Now that said, it's not all roses. Not everything about this lens is my favorite. So let's dive into the things that are a little odd, quirky, or things that I just frankly don't like. The first thing, this is touted as a full frame lens. And a lot of people who are making videos about this are calling it a full frame lens. And while that is not entirely incorrect, it's also not entirely correct either. In talking with the Great Joy folks, I was asking about the circle of illumination uh, or the sensor coverage that this lens would have. Uh, and while it will work on most full frame cameras, it primarily will only work on full frame cameras that are able to shoot open gate or able to shoot 4.3 to then be able to de-squeeze into the proper aspect ratio. If you have a full frame camera that only shoots in 16 by nine in terms of the aspect ratio, uh, this is gonna be way wider than a 1.8 and you're gonna see a lot of really, really bad vignetting in the corners. Check the size of the sensor of your camera and make sure that the circle of illumination of this lens works with that camera and make sure that if you are shooting in full frame, that you are shooting in full frame for three because that's what's going to de-squeeze into the proper aspect ratio and give you the behavior that this lens is intended to give you. 
In order to make a lens that is this cost effective, that performs in the range that it does, uh, there are some things that are a little odd about it. So it uses what is called a synchro focus design. And it's just the way that the glass elements within the lens move and how they're paired together and how that all works. Uh, again, makes a lot of sense for being a, a budget lens in this space. But the side effect of a synchro focus design is that the actual squeeze factor, so this is a 1.8 times squeeze or de-squeeze, uh, changes throughout the focal throw. So from four meters through infinite focus, you are at that 1.8 times squeeze. But when you pull focus in closer than four meters, that squeeze factor actually starts to change. So from four meters to two meters, it goes from a 1.8 to a 1.76. And then if you pull it in even further from two to one meter, it goes from 1.76 to 1.67. And then if you take it from one meter to its minimum focal distance of 0 0.7 meters, it then goes from a 1.67 to a 1.62. Again, that is a side effect of the way that the lens elements move within the lens. That's just indicative of the way that this lens is designed. And frankly, it doesn't matter. It's not the end of the world, especially if you're shooting in resolutions that are higher than your final outputs. It's really not that big of a deal. All you do is go into Premiere uh, or whatever your nonlinear editor is, and you just adjust the vertical scale independently from the horizontal scale. And I just do it to eyeballing just to what feels right. So you take a shot that looks like this, and then you just move it to something like this. So you're gonna be losing a little bit of your image. It's not that big of a deal. I think that it works just fine. But I would adjust your squeeze factor, uh, depending on where your shot is, because people kind of look funky if you don't change it. But again, small price to pay for a lens that's you know gonna be 16, $1,700 versus eight grand, 20 grand, 80 grand, and beyond. The last thing that's kind of odd about this lens is the flange distance of their EF and PL mounts. So you can see here, uh, this is the EF mount, and there is quite a distance from the mount uh, to the end of our lens optic here. And the reason why I bring this up is because if you're like me, you could be rocking a camera that needs a focal reducer or a, a speed booster, or maybe a drop in filters, right? Those kind of things. And you can't use any of that with this. And on top of that, you need to uh, make sure that whatever camera that you are working with uh, is compatible with having such a recessed uh, back element here. So uh, while this would work just fine on mirrorless cameras, I have heard people say that the EF1 works totally fine with a Blackmagic Pocket uh, 6K and 6K Pro. You can't use it with drop-in filters. You can't use it with focal reducers. You can't use it with speed boosters. So just know that uh, because I have a red Komodo and I do use a focal reducer on that for most of what I shoot. This doesn't fit on that, right? So then you would need to make sure that you have an adapter like this guy, which is the standard Canon EF to RF adapter, but again, uh, no glass in it at all. And that then mounts just fine onto here like that. And then you can see here that this mounting point is nice and clear from that back element like that. So something to keep in mind, not my favorite thing. I would love to have a flush EF or a flush PL uh, that said, not the end of the world, just something to be mindful of when you're thinking about the mounts that you want this lens to have. $1,600 is not no money. Right? And if you are an owner operator or a solo shooter or somebody who's kind of just starting out in the anamorphic world, 1600 bucks can be a ton of money. In my humble opinion, I do believe that this is worth $1,600. Is it perfect? No, but at $1,600, I think that the quirks of the lens aren't enough to dissuade me from buying or using it. I'm excited that this is gonna be a lens set. I'm excited to get 35 and the 85. I wanna use an entire set. I want the close-ups, I want the mediums, I want the wides. And the fact that that's coming is really, really cool. Uh, there are links below if you're interested in this stuff, uh, if you wanna buy one. But if you have comments, questions, or concerns about that lens, other stuff, things that you wanna learn about, comment them down below. I do like to try to make content that you wanna watch. Also, this is part one of a two-part series of how we shot this dog micro short. If you wanna learn how to shoot in the rain outside, still getting really dynamic lighting, while again, it's raining, 
subscribe and hit that little bell icon so you can know when part two comes out. And as always, I'll see you in the next episode.